contract ju jurisdictions and civil rights. Russian politician and public figure, the most prominent libertarian in Russia. Chairman of the Civil Society Movement, Chairman of the Ethics Committee of the Libertarian Party of Russia, and author of the SVTV channel. Founder of the first libertarian club in Europe, New Sincerity. Bitcoin, Bitcoin evangelist and since 2011. He organized a series of political rallies in 2018 to 2020 in Russia. The biggest one in Moscow was attended by over 50,000 people. He has conducted lectures about libertarianism in over 70 cities in Russia, and his biggest lecture in Moscow sold over uh, 1,200 tickets. Please welcome Mr. Mihaly. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mikhail Svetov. I'm going to spend like 10 minutes to introduce myself a little bit better just to show that I know what I'm talking about. Uh, yes, I indeed organized some of the biggest rallies in modern history of Russia. These are the four most, uh, most prominent ones. The biggest one was 50,000 people. You can see the pictures there. And this is a libertarian flag of Russia that I uh, drew. Uh, this is uh, um, a rally in defense of freedom of speech and free internet in Russia. This is uh, a rally uh, in defense of Telegram. Uh, Telegram is a heavily encrypted messaging ser uh, service that's created by Pavel Durov, who is a prominent libertarian as well. It's heavily used in Russia, and the Russian government tries to ban it. It's actually one of the, I think it's the only uh, rally in modern Russian history that actually achieved its goal uh, in uh, uh, in sense that Telegram still works in Russia, and that's uh, in... Uh, uh, thanks to the Libertarian Party of Russia and the rallies that we held. And that's the other one that's a rally against isolation of Russian internet. Uh, we have this law that's called Yaravaya Law uh, that is actually trying to uh, create a firewall like the Chinese firewall, but in Russia. And we held a rally against that as well. Rally was attended by over 20,000 people. Um, that's me speaking at the rally, at one of the rallies. Just, just, uh, yeah, that's the flag. Uh, the flag, um, I invented it, uh, drew it three years ago, libertarian, flag of libertarian Russia. You see the Gadsden snake and the Russian, uh, uh, Russian flag. Uh, my biggest thing, the thing I'm most proud of, I've read lectures in 70 cities of Russia in the last three years, and 30 of them I visited in a span of just one month. Uh, I was just traveling from east to, uh, from west to east of Russia uh, every day reading a lecture, doing the same thing that Donald Trump did in the U.S., and they were extremely successful. I'm just going to show some pictures just uh, so you know I'm not making that up. So that's uh, St. Petersburg. That's a Murray Rothbard. Um, uh, that's Adam Smith Forum in Moscow. Sorry, that's one of the bigger events that we hold. That's an annual event. Mm -hmm. uh, it was attended by 1,200 people in Moscow. You can see the pictures. That's me talking. Uh, that's uh, Vladimir. Vladimir is a small city of 80, 800,000 people, and uh, I was visiting small cities as well. That's my lecture there. That's Arkhangelsk, and just uh, people always ask me, you know, is it easy to be a libertarian in Russia? No, it's really hard, and I'm going to talk about it uh, a little bit later in my speech, but Arkhangelsk was a fun place. Every city I go to, pretty much every other city I go to, the government tried to cancel my event, and they go really far to do that. And in Arkhangelsk, we had five venues cancel at the same, at the last moment the last hour. So what I did is, like, after the uh, event was already announced, I made a plea on my Twitter asking, you know, well, you know, everybody is canceling. Everybody is afraid. The, if somebody is reading me from our Congress, please help. We, we just need to do this event. Because if government cancels it once, it will cancel it over and over again because it will feel like it, it's capable to do that. So I was actually invited to read a lecture in a yoga class, and I was reading it in a yoga class because no other venue would, uh, would accept me. And even there, uh, what happened is people in camouflage came and they turned off the lights and they said that there was a bomb and that they said that there was a bomb in the building. Uh, making everyone to leave, but they didn't have any, it wasn't police, it was just people in camouflage, so I refused to leave, and that's where I learned something about humans, is that they actually, uh, humans in general are followers, so when the person uh, entered the room and he said, well, everybody leave, everybody has to leave, people hesitated, and you know, they, they started to, to exit the room, and I said, well, what the hell, I'm, I haven't finished reading my lecture, uh, which you shouldn't leave, you know, just, uh, I can read my lecture in the dark, because they turned off the lights, and people just uh, took out their cell phones, and started to lit me up and uh, I finished, uh, finished my lecture. So yeah, uh, that's Saratov, that's another small city, just, just pictures. Uh, Kostroma, uh, Minsk in Belarus, that's before Belarusian Revolution. I went to Kiev and Minsk as well uh, to read a lecture. So um, yeah, and that's the picture from our Congress. That's a 
after the lights were turned off and people took out their cell phones to light me up. Uh, that's my lecture in Moscow. That's my solo, uh, the first big one really. And that's me reading uh, the lecture. Uh, that's uh, Miri Rothbard Forum in St. Petersburg. That's our biggest event in St. Petersburg, attended by over 1,600 people. Uh, just a crazy success. Uh, we had some pe uh, people from abroad. And again, when people approach me in the West and ask, well, we didn't know that there, is, there are libertarians in Russia, I always act surprised because, well, you should have, uh, uh, if you Google, you'll learn that uh, li uh, Russian libertarians is the most successful libertarian party in Europe today. Um, I also organized a, a joint lecture with Hans Hermann Hoppe, which was the most uh, attended lecture in the libertarian history. And I'm going to show you a video clip just in a second. Can you put a video on? This is uh, in the world, not just in Europe, not just in Russia, but US including. That's the biggest lecture a libertarian ever held. Yeah, and if, you, if you're interested, this lecture is available on my YouTube channel in English. Yeah, check it out. Can you turn on the lights just for a sec, if it's possible? And that's a, uh, that's a, yeah. Really that you're that's a line to the lecture. Yeah, so uh, if you're interested, it's available in English on my YouTube channel, and it's the biggest uh, libertarian lecture ever held in the world. Uh, it was attended uh, at um, Murray Rothbard Forum, uh, had a total um, amount of visitors, uh, 1,600, but this one was attended at the same time, at the same moment, in the same room by um, over 1,300 people. Yeah, uh, oof, we're gonna, sorry. I also have a talk with uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe on my channel, which is separate from the lecture. All right, um, but it's not always easy, as I said. And uh, I've also read lectures from unusual places. I've read a lecture from inside the police van, because during one of the Adam Smith forums, I wasn't uh, actually allowed to attend the forum. I was caught on the street by the police, and they put me in the police van. Uh, and uh, I, and uh, I was, uh, I did, again, it's my principle, I would never left. Uh, government to cancel my lectures, so I actually recorded a lecture on my cell phone and I uploaded it to uh, to the cloud, and they played it on the Adam Smith forum while I was inside the police van. And if you're interested, it's available on my uh, YouTube channel as well. And the lecture was about how libertarianism is actually good for the poor, because that was the idea I'm promoting in Russia heavily at the time. I was promoting heavily in Russia at the time. That's a picture of me inside the police van reading the lecture. Um, I also spoke on one of the rallies that we organized. I couldn't attend it either because I was apprehended after I refused to negotiate with the, uh, with the um, uh, Russian government, Moscow government, and I was put in jail. And another thing I did, which I'm very proud of, is that I actually recorded a speech. My, my lawyer uh, snuggled, smuggled the recorder into my cell, and I recorded a speech for that rally from inside the cell uh, for it to be played uh, on, the, on the rally, and it's also available on my YouTube channel. Uh, but I've been arrested several times. Just two months ago, I was in jail. I got out of jail, of jail two months ago. Uh, and uh, these are some articles that were written about me. I had uh, police raid my home three times. Uh, I had uh, some uh, 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 criminal cases fabricated ag ag against me, like sexual mi misconduct. And the Russian government is very smart. They know that they, if, you, if they uh, create a political case against you, you become a martyr. So what they do, they create uh, dirty cases like sexual misconduct, like Nazi propaganda. <coughs> this, is, this one is really funny. Uh, what the, the, um, I was uh, put in jail for 10 days for having an educational video on my YouTube, to YouTube channel where I explain the political compass. And in one corner, you have uh, uh, bloodthirsty tyrants. You have communists and you have Nazis. And I featured swastika there explaining that Nazis are bloodthirsty tyrants. And this is, was deemed by Russian court as Nazi propaganda. And I was put in jail. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was jailed for nine days. Those are all separate cases. So it just happens all the time, all the time. And uh, the biggest, um, the longest time I've been in jail was 30 days. That's uh, during one of the bigger rallies I organized. 
uh, that's me being, uh, being <laughs> apprehended by the system. Uh, but uh, I also had some terrible cases happening with me in Kemerovo. I was going to read a, a lecture in Kemerovo. I took a plane there, and the moment I left the plane, a thugs uh, caught me. They beat me up. They throw me in the room. They take away my, uh, my documents. They held me there for uh, several hours, and uh, they, <coughs> and after that, they put me on an empty tr uh, on the empty plane back to Moscow, telling me that they will not allow me to to hold a lecture in Kemerovo, and that was actually the only time that the lecture was canceled. It was really scary. It's probably the scariest thing that ever happened to me. Uh, I was beaten up, put on an empty plane. I felt like a, someone out of James Bond movie, really. But uh, in a few months, I went back to Kemerovo. Uh, I didn't take a plane. I took a car from a nearby city, and I uh, managed to have a lecture there anyway. It's one of the 70 cities that I uh, worked in. Uh, so yeah, um, I was hit with a thesis, so other kinds of pressure has been following as well. So it's not easy to be a libertarian in Russia, but you've got to push on if you want to reach any kind of, uh, any kind of success. Um, that's Alexei Navalny. I worked with Alexei Navalny. You know the guy. It's the, uh, it's the leader of Russian opposition. The man who was poisoned by the government just a, uh, a short year ago. He's in jail right now. And uh, we had a successful collaboration with him. Uh, I met Rand Paul when he came to Russia. Uh, he, um, uh, he wanted to meet some Russian opposition. And naturally, um, naturally, my name came up because I'm the most prominent libertarian in Russia. So he's a great guy. I uh, had a great time with him. I uh, opened the first libertarian club in Russia, New Sincerity. It's in the old building. You see Ayn Rand here. There's a Murray Rothbard portrait, which is up right now, but it's there. Uh, God's Den Snake. That's, uh, I owned this uh, club for, uh, since uh, uh, 2020, but I had to close it uh, because of the coronavirus and because government just wouldn't let it exist. They closed it for three months, then they closed it for another one month. So it didn't exist for a long time, but it was a big dream that I tried, that I tried to realize. That's the Ramiro Rothbard right there. And I was, it's closed now. It's been closed for two months now. So yeah. And now for the theoretical part. So now that you know my credentials, you know who I am. Uh, you know this guy, right? Uh, and he has this great punchline. Facts don't care about your feelings. And uh, he's been selling this idea to the audience. And I know that libertarians are very partial to this idea as well, because we all, you know we have such a great theory. Everybody should support it. It's so great. But I have bad news for you. Uh, and I have bad news for this guy as well, for, for Ben Shapiro, that you know, feelings don't care about your facts either. Uh, and unless you understand that, Unless you understand that, you will not become politically successful. Because for libertarian ideas to spread, for libertarian ideas to become successful, you've got to become populist. You've got to touch not just people's minds, because it's impossible to educate everyone. Because not everyone has to be a politician. And being a libertarian actually means to be either philosopher, economist, or politician. And people are just not that. You've got to talk to them uh, in language they understand. And that's language of emotion. That's language of passion. Uh, and that's uh, language that uh, touches their hearts and not just their minds. And I think that was, uh, that's the biggest problem libertarians have at the moment in the West. And that, uh, that's the idea that I was, that's the um, problem I was trying to solve in Russia. And I think I solved successfully because before I started my work in Russia four years ago, all that I showed you uh, we achieved in just short four, two, four years uh, is because I understood that a libertarian message can be delivered by populist means. And I really wish there would be more populist libertarians ready to speak with people on the terms they understand without going into those crazy ideas like the Ken mentioned, um, uh, I think it was Ken, uh, that, uh, you know, theoretical things like should you take drugs, uh, should you sell children in slavery, etc., etc. That's just not productive. Please don't, uh, don't over discuss it. And uh, there are ways to talk about libertarians that do not include those things. Um, it doesn't matter how good your message is if your delivery sucks. And I'm sorry to say that libertarians suck at delivery. That's uh, another truthful sent uh, sent uh, sentence that goes with this one. Behavior is more honest than words. And libertarians are not pra practicing what they preach. The reason I had success in Russia is because I was not just talking, I was doing. Every event I was holding was a uh, clash with the police. It was a clash with the government. It was inconvenient. People saw it. People saw that I was fighting for the event. And that's what attracted attention to me. They saw that we are not losers. Libertarians need to be winners. They need to practice what they preach. And unfortunately, libertarians are not doing that uh, today. And uh, Jan Kuban, in his lecture, uh, said that uh, 
people listen to, why do people listen <coughs> to people like Hitler, Stalin, Maduro, etc. Et I have answer to that because they are willing to fight for power and libertarians are not willing to fight for freedom. That's an important thing. Again, that's leading by example. Libertarians have to lead by example. It doesn't matter how many good words you're going to say. Uh, as, long as, you're, uh, as, as long as you're not practicing what you preach, people will not listen to you because they think you're a phony. They're going to think you're a, uh, they're going to think uh, um, you're trying to, to, to lie to them. You, you're trying to push them into something you're not doing yourself. And I'm sorry to say that libertarians are not practicing what they preach, and I'm going to explain why I think so. So people don't want to be explained. They want to be inspired. They want to be moved. And that's why left, uh, left, uh, leftists are so good at uh, creating, for, at, uh, amassing followers, at selling their ideas, because they're selling a dream, uh, they're selling a passion, and they're selling the sense of justice. Libertarians have not been selling a sense of justice for the longest time. Uh, and that's the theoretical part. So in Romans, there's a phrase that I really, really love. Uh, that's, uh, it says that where there is no law, there is no transgression. And my lecture today, a new title of my uh, lecture is called Libertarian Revolution. Uh, and I think uh, libertarians were too wary of revolutionary ideas. Well, well I think that uh, unless we come to terms with the fact that we're not living in the uh, uh, that we're not living in the, um, sorry, I forgot the word, sorry. Um, and I think libertarians have to come to terms with the idea that right as we understand it does not exist. And I have issues, and that's my only point of disagreement with Rothbard, I have issues with the idea of natural law and, uh, and uh, principle of non-aggression as a natural law, because there is nothing above uh, humans. Humans are the only origin of law. Contract is the only origin of law. And if we realize that, um, libertarian ideas become much more revolutionary. Why? Because where there is no law, because where there is no law, there is no transgression. And we're, we're good at criticizing government. We're terrible at fighting government because something's stopping us. And I think that what's stopping libertarians is not just fear of, re of repercussion. It's also some moral uh, it's, uh, it's also something moral because we don't believe what we're saying. We don't believe that government is illegitimate. We don't believe that uh, what government does is coercion because we're not willing to fight against that. If we were, uh, when we face injustice in, in, in life, uh, we defend ourselves, but we don't defend ourselves from the government. And the reason is not only just that we don't have a biggest gun, like Mark said uh, yesterday, uh, because some people don't need biggest gun to fight for justice. And uh, the, I'm not drawing, <laughs> I'm not drawing the equivalency here, but we just had a great example the second time in a row in this in the 20th and 21st century in Afghanistan. No, they didn't have biggest gun. They fought for what we believe is not just, but they believe is just, and they won. They won against Soviet Union, they won again uh, against uh, American army, they didn't have anything. It's just like uh, some dude with a, with a rifle on a donkey, and they took over American army, they took over Soviet army. That should give you ideas. That should give you ideas that if you believe into some, in something strongly, if you have a will to freedom, a will to power, you will succeed. And libertarians have no will whatsoever at the moment. It's not enough to identify the disease. Yeah, we know government is terrible. You have to treat it too. You have to treat the disease of government. And the only way you're going to treat, uh, yeah. And the only way you're going to treat the disease is if you're actually going to face it, if you're not going to submit to it, uh, but going to do something about it. And again, there was a lecture uh, by Mark about live and let live, and I already mentioned it in my question to him. Uh, yeah, it's a good concept, but or what? What if uh, you have to pose? Why should people leave you alone? That's the question you should ask yourself. Yeah, it's a good concept, but why should people leave you alone? What threat do you pose? I understand what, ta uh, what threat Taliban poses. That's why governments talk to them. That's why they invite them to White House. That's why they invite them to Kremlin. Taliban just talked to uh, Ministry of uh, Foreign Defense of Russia a couple of, months, uh, couple of weeks ago. I understand why they're talking to Taliban. There's no reason to talk to uh, libertarians because why should you? You you'll, will submit to anything. We're not fighting, and if we're not fighting, nobody is going to respect us for what we are. If you think, uh, another uh, quote that I picked up during uh, this conference is, if you think that libertarians can, uh, if you think that libertarianism can be achieved without a revolution, you're not a libertarian. 
Do you think government is just going to give up all its power just because you want to be left alone? I highly doubt that. And we have to realize that deep inside, if we are libertarians, if we practice what we preach, we have to realize government will never give up its power that it has over us. And uh, the only solution is, the only options we have is to submit or to fight. Because uh, freedom is not granted, freedom is taken. Another. Dr. Ken read a great lecture. On the first day of this conference, he was talking about incentives. And that's another thing that fascinates me, and I'm, fasc and, uh, I'm um, flabbergasted. Why do I have to explain it to libertarians? Is that incentives are much more important than words. It doesn't matter what theory you have. It doesn't matter how just it is. If you have incentives in place that incentivize people to side with the government, they will always win out, 100%. You can't rely. You can't bet all you've got on the goodwill of people, because it just doesn't work. And we as libertarians have to understand that better than anyone else, because that's how markets work. No amount of goodwill will change a market incentive. And the market incentive we have right now in place is that it's uh, through the game theory. We all know what game theory is. It makes it rational to side with the government. It's not an optimal. A way of life, but it's a rational choice every single time, and it will win out. Again, game theory works because it's an economic law. For the same reason, governments will always win unless we can provide an incentive, uh, unless we can provide the incentive that makes it either scary to side with the government or profitable to side with us. That's the only choice. That's how markets. That's how markets uh, work. Um, and uh, a quote that I didn't put on my uh, presentation, that, but I really like, that unless it's politically profitable, profitable for the wrong people to do the right thing, it will be politically unprofitable for the right people to do the right thing. Again, that's markets for you. That's game theory. That's incentives. You've got to realize that. So if you are a libertarian, if you practice what you preach, you've got to be a revolutionary, because that's the only choice. Because everything else is submission to the laws of market, is submission to the laws of, uh, uh, of economy. Right. And I want to remind you a phrase of a great Barry Goldwater that I translated into Russia and popularized it in Russia. It hasn't been translated into Russian before I started using it, but I really love it. Um, extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice, and moderation in pursuit of justice is no virtue. And I see a lot of moderates here, and I see very little extremists. And that upsets me, and that's why we lose. And thank you very much. Okay, now we're going to have questions uh, about what's going on in Russia, which I think affects, uh, in a way, the rest of the world's politics. Yeah. It's rather remarkable, the question. I, am, I think that it's very inspiring that you manage to gather young people. Okay, so here is... Uh, Sounds old, challenged guys, okay? And you manage to just to talk to the future generation, probably immortal, maybe or not. But uh, congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I wanted to ask you a question yeah. about something that we were talking the other day, and it's um, you told me that uh, you believe that Russia is not going to change until Vladimir Putin dies. Um, why do you think there is no other way to, to change politics in Russia? Uh, because he's in control of the country 100%, and the only real adversary that he had, Alexei Navalny, uh, he's in jail right now, and there's nobody who can help him. Uh, Alexei Navalny really miscalculated uh, his position. I think he really uh, overplayed his hand, unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately, and now there's nobody that can help him. Uh, Putin is in a very stable position right now, and uh, it's going to stay uh, that way for the longest time because there's no insurrection, there's no uh, uh, there's no part partisans in Russia. You know, nothing is going on, and unfortunately, I don't see how it can be changed now. If you asked me this question a year ago, I would have given a completely different answer because we had Alexei Navalny. And it really felt like civil society can do something. Now it's different. And even all the things that I showed you, I've been doing it just before, like two months ago, really. But uh, most of the stuff I did is impossible to do in Russia today. It was possible just a short year ago, but it's impossible today because uh, 
like, um, I, obviously, I haven't done it alone. Uh, we, have a, we have 40 chapters of Libertarian Party of Russia in 40 cities of Russia. Uh, and, but uh, my entire team is dispersed right now. Uh, five uh, of my friends are in jail or under house arrest. I was in jail just two mon months ago. I had my house search for the third time just two months ago. Uh, my closest associates had to leave the country two, week, uh, two months ago uh, under the threat of getting, being jailed. So uh, Putin, unfortunately, is in total control and it just how things are. Mikhail. Yes. Live or end, live or what? What's the what? Or what, what are you going to do? If I'm not letting you live like you want, what are you going to do? Fight. Are you? Are you fighting? I don't see any fighting. I see my house. <laughs> I think I'm very impressed about your activities and your political party. These numbers, these young people, this music, this is all really amazing. And I think many of us would like to see more of this in other countries. So how do you do this? How do you sell? And he, because that was even not free of charge, right? How do yes. you sell an event with an uh, older guy, uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, for 1,200 people and make him a rock star? How, how do you do this? Well, it's, uh... You, you don't make people pay. Uh, you don't make people who attend pay. You make people who are, uh, you know, who pay for themselves and for the other guy. So what I do is I make, uh, I collect donations first. Uh, I say how much money do I need to hold this event to invite uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe because I had to uh, pay him as well uh, for his speech. Uh, and uh, I have uh, enough audience for people to 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 to, to collect that money. And then uh, we open the event for everyone. And that's an important thing. And that's actually uh, my surprise was uh, when I came to Madeline is that this event is closed and we're preaching to the choir here. I don't know why, like, uh, there's nothing really new uh, Walter Block can tell any one of us. We should have people from Madeline here, you know, and we should promote this as a free event. There are people who are willing to pay for more younger audience coming here. And that's what I was doing in Russia. I just fundraised and every single lecture that I had was fundraised. So I just say, well, like for, for example, this uh, tour that I made uh, uh, around 30 cities in 35 days. Uh, what I did is, is I just picked up cities that I never visited and I announced that, hey, you know, I'm planning to do this tour, you know I'm capable of it, so let's uh, fundraise. Uh, if, you, if you live in any of those cities, please help me to find a venue, please help me to fundraise and I'll come and I speak free of charge. And in four days, I had people organizing my lecture in each one of those 30 cities. It's amazing. I have a question. Uh, yeah, here. Uh, yeah. We had seen Rothbard, Hall, Ayn Rand, who came from the American tradition. Do you appeal to any thinker or philosopher from the Russian tradition when you do your speeches? Um, we don't really have a libertarian tradition in Russia because of the Soviet Union. And I think uh, the biggest impact, uh, theoretical impact uh, on Russian discourse there was is actually the one I made. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> All right, so fighting, what do you mean by that? Are you buying arms? Or are you going to the streets with guns? Buying arms, yeah. What do you mean? Buying arms has nothing to do with uh, actual fighting. We see a lot of uh, armed uh, citizens in the US. They're not fighting. They're just playing with guns. Uh, so, uh, but uh, I understand. Uh, the question is, you see, we have to learn from our enemies. See, look what the left does. Whenever a left radical does something obscene, they uh, step up in favor of that person. Doesn't matter what he did. You know, the Black Lives Matter movement burned out American cities, and the uh, liberals, the moderate liberals, they stepped in and said, well, you know, they have a reason for doing that. This is justified. What do libertarians do if, I don't know, what will you do if uh, a taxman will get attacked by a libertarian? Oh, you're going to say, well, you know, I'm not supporting that. I'm a moderate, you know, and let me remind you that moderation uh, is not a virtue. Uh, so we have, to st we have to step in fa in defense of people who are ready to be radical, who are ready to fight. I understand not everybody can fight. Not everybody is a revolutionary. Not everybody is a fighter. But the least you can do, every each one of us can do, is to step in defense of those who do fight. And I haven't seen that at all. And even uh, talking about the... Um, okay, I'm not going to go there. It's too American. Sorry. Go on, go on, go on. <laughs> oh, sure. I, I'm, gonna, I'm afraid to offend people here. Do it. Do it. Do it. Oh, well. Okay, do it. 
no, you, you got to step out, you got to step in defense of people who are ready to be radical, even if you don't share their values 100%. And what you saw uh, on the 6th of January in the US, I know people are not happy with what happened, but those were radicals. Uh, those were people willing to fight. And you know what left would have done if those were liberal uh, radicals? They would have defended them uh, till the end. What did libertarians do? And there was a lot of libertarians there. They turned the other way and said, well, I even heard it from this, uh, uh, from here, up here, that, well, you know, that's not what we are. Well, until that's not what we are, we're going to be losers. Hi, I'm Nicole. Thank you for this inspirational speech. I would to ask you, you were uh, talking about fighting for freedom, right? Mm -hmm. But what did you make, uh, what did you make you take the decision to fight for freedom, even putting your own freedom in risk and your own life in risk? It's not like... <coughs> Something bigger than freedom? Oh, no, I don't think so. I think that's the biggest liberal lie there is. What's the point of living if you're a slave your entire life? I enjoy doing it, what I do. I do it for the rush. I do it for the fun. I do it for the justice. I do it because it makes me feel alive, unlike sitting on, uh, in front of a computer doing nothing. You know, that's, you know, if you're sitting in, in front of a computer doing nothing, you're not alive. That's not what life is. Uh, right here. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, so a couple of questions. So the first one, what is your immediate future look like? Uh, you say that it's very difficult to fight at the moment, not to Putin dies, nothing is going to change in Russia. So what are you guys going to do? First thing, and, and second thing, uh, how do you bring science behind your message? Do you have academics working behind, you know, uh, the doors and, and, and crafting papers or helping you with data and so on and so forth to to, you know, uh, to make a message? Yeah, uh, well, I, I have some academics that consult with in Russia. Uh, my immediate future, I've been promising to finish a book for the last two years, but I've been too do busy doing events. And now that I'm an, unable to do events, I'll be finishing my book. And I have some ideas that, again, are quite radical in a good sense, I think, and that are not well discussed. The, the biggest one that I already mentioned is the contract of non-aggression. I really think that the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest uh, roadblock on success of the libertarian movement is this idea of natural law and that principle of non-aggression. Uh, and that's the principle of non-aggression is that something that exists uh, above uh, human agency. I disagree with that strongly, and I'm going to prove my point. Uh, but I've been consulting. I've been consulting Hans Hermann Hoppe. I've been in touch with uh, Walter Block, uh, whom I respect immensely. I've actually almost organized his lecture as well, in uh, similar to the ones Hoppe had. But the uh, Chinese coronavirus uh, got involved, and the borders get closed, and uh, unfortunately, get cancelled because of that, and there was nothing I could do. But I'm talking to the thinkers, of course. I have a two-part question. Yeah. Now that the economy is pretty much neutralized, is there any, any significant opposition to Putin and Putinism in the, besides the Libertarian Party? And part two is, do you have food tasters? Do you have people watching out for you? Because, he, I mean, doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that the economy is not going to be an aberration. Uh, yeah, uh, we were always number two. So there was a Navalny who was uh, like, uh, he was protecting everyone pretty much. As long as he was alive, government didn't bother too much with libertarians. But once he was out of the pictures, we were crushed as well. Uh, so there are a few chapters left in Russia that are active in St. Petersburg. We're actually, uh, our candidate is actually trying to run in the local ele election. And we had some successful elections uh, before that in Moscow and uh, smaller cities of Russia. Uh, but uh, Right now, it's really hard. So there are a few people left, and I'm very afraid for them. Yeah. Uh, sorry, you know, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, one of the uh, things I've noticed in the movement, and it seems to be becoming more of a problem, at least among American libertarians, is the fact that a lot of them are just kind of blinding and blaming the state for their problems. And, you know, a lot, and they're often very unreliable. You know that. You know, that, you know if a libertarian says, "I'm going to show up at seven o'clock," I generally don't expect them to show up at seven o'clock. Uh, which is kind of, kind of, of course, it depends on. You know, I can kind of feel which ones are going to be flaky and what ones aren't. And, and some of them, their lives are just in a shambles. And it seems like to me, we're not going to go anywhere until we can, can at least 
look like we're doing great things with our own lives. You know, it's like, like Jordan Peterson says, clean your room, you know. No, I agree with that completely. It's just uh, there are different kinds of libertarians, and the problem with the movement was is that we are, were distancing. Uh, libertarians need a radical wing. That's how, uh, that's how the left uh, are winning all the time, because they have radicals doing the dirty work, and then the moderate says, well, you know, yeah, we, we, we're not condoning that, but they, it's justified, and we've got to do something you know, to tame them, to tame the radicals. Libertarians need to have their own radicals, or nothing's going to change, because, why, again, the question is, Live or live, um, it's a great slogan, live or let live, but or what? What are you going to do if not left alone? If you're not ready to do anything, and not one of us uh, is not ready to do anything, then of course there's no point of, live, of, of leaving you alone. Because by not leaving you alone, we take your uh, government takes your money away, it takes your property away, it takes your freedom away, you remain a slave. There's all kinds of incentives, market incentives, to, to not leaving you alone. And there's not a single one for doing so. Think about that. Okay, last question of the event. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, I have two questions. One was already asked by uh, my interview singer, but I didn't catch her answer about uh, how do you keep from being murdered. Uh, and the second question is, uh, you said about the overplayed hand. Could you elaborate? Um, yeah, I'll start with the second part. Uh, so uh, Navalny had the streak of success, and that was enormous success. He felt like an untouchable. So he survived the poisoning. Uh, he managed to get hold of the people who actually attempted his murder. Uh, he uh, uncovered their names, and he published their names. That was a huge success. Then he released his investigation into Putin's palace, which is like a ridiculous, pompous building that costs more than a billion dollars. And that was another huge success. Uh, he had uh, this uh, streak of incredibly successful rallies in Moscow as well. He managed to uh, create his own chapters all over Russia, which were, m like you saw my success, but his success was much bigger, let's say five to ten times bigger. Uh, so, and he felt immortal, and I can see why, because for the longest time, everything was going the right way for him. Uh, and um, when he made a decision to return to Russia, um, I think he felt that people will flood the streets and come into his support, and they just didn't do that. So he overestimated, uh, he overestimated the courage of the people, he overestimated the kind of people that were supporting him, and again, he was, he was very moderate, and that was his problem as well. He didn't have any radicals on his side. When he didn't have radicals, moderates will be afraid to go out on the streets. And that's, that's true for him, that's true for libertarians. So, uh, we love your presentation, love your delivery, love your energy, love what you're up to, love what you're doing. Yeah. Gonna hate seeing you in prison. Gonna hate seeing you like the other guy, Navalny. What's he doing right now? Nothing. Yeah. He's doing nothing to advance the movement. We have to be smart about how we present our positions. We're on the same page. I notice we're both trying to capture hearts and minds. That's the old one. The old one is we're going to do something about it, but we've got to have a credible threat to do something about it. Unless and until we got enough people on our side. That's the reason you're having big groups. We need more people on our side. We need more right people. More what? Um, more people. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Uh, we, we need... Okay, we need more. Uh, we just we don't. You don't, see the uh, the number of people doesn't change things. It's the quality of people that matters as well. And uh, the quality of people in the libertarian movement has been poor. Not in the sense that we're dumb or you know uh, can't make money whatsoever. No, not fighters. We need more fighters. But when you say radical, there are two different varieties of radicals, right? One is your your philosophy, right? The person we've talked about, the minimalist sometimes, the person who says, well, a little bit of violation of the non-aggression principle is okay. That's the moderate we don't like. Mm -hmm. We can get the maybe radical or principled position. That's your hardcore, real libertarian anarcho-capitalist. What we do about it is a different question. And I'm suggesting if you're too in the face of the man, like you are, like your team is right now, scattered to the winds and ineffective, we're going to hurt ourselves in the end, so we have to think about balance in terms of winning enough people. As we get more and more people, we can get more and more tough on the war. What part?
Right. You're absolutely right. And uh, there, there are two sides to the libertarian movements. There, has to, there have to be li moderates. There have to be moderates. Because without the moderates, uh, radicals are doomed as well. And the, the communists, they understood it really well. The communists, they have uh, uh, social revolutionaries in the uh, early 20th century. And they had the moderates that were uh, sort of distancing themselves in a, in, a, uh, in a way that they weren't doing it. But they were saying, well, you know, people are fed up. Look what happens when people are fed up. Listen to us. But in order for you to be listened by anyone, there has to be people that uh, are radical. And you should not turn your back to them. That's the most important thing. Never. It doesn't matter if it looks dirty. It doesn't matter if you don't condemn what they're doing, if you're not agreeing 100%. But you, you, you should not turn your back to them. Because if they're going to feel that they'll be alone, one-on-one -on -one with the government, then they will not create an incentive necessary for it uh, to be profitable to fight the government. We should do a Zoom discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.